Gospel of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament, chapter 7, verses 11 to 17. If you don't have it, I have it up front. This is what it says. Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples and a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. And a large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her and said, Don't cry. Then he went up and touched the bier they were carrying him on, and the bearers stood still. He said, Young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. They were all filled with awe and praised God. A great prophet that has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. Last verse. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and even the surrounding country. We're talking about courage in compassion or being courageous in terms of compassion. Elderly Mrs. Adams frequently visited the post office. It was near her house. She was there because the employees there were friendly to her. Now, just before Christmas, one year, the lines in the post office were very long. And someone kindly pointed out to her, um, Mrs. Adams, you know, you don't have to line up with this long snaking line. There's a stamp machine in the lobby. Mrs. Adams says, oh, I, I know. She said it in a queenly manner. <laughs> oh, I know. But the machine doesn't ask me about my arthritis, and it doesn't look at the pictures of my grandkids. In an ultra-modern world and society, that we have, there are still many, absolutely many, that are hungry, even starving for care, for kindness, for compassion, for that personal touch, especially after a two-year pandemic. People are what I would call compassion-starved. They're looking for that personal touch. They're looking for someone who cares for that act of kindness. And that tells us some things in terms of our study for today. Number one, it means that compassion will never go out of style. It's not going to go out of style. Compassion and being kind and being loving and caring is still in. Amen? So tell the person to your left or to your right, compassion is still in. Galit, you know? That means also that compassionate people will continue to be in high demand. Right? You know how during the pandemic, a lot of medical, medical practitioners were in demand. Not only in demand, they were at high risk, but they were high in demand. But today, because we're compassion starved, compassionate people will continue to be in high demand. That means, for us Christ followers, this is an opportunity to create an impact. This is an opportunity to increase our influence. This is an opportunity to be the salt and light that God has called us to be, and that is because of compassion. We need people that will be courageous in terms of compassion. Our passage this morning, Luke chapter 7, 11 to 17, shows us one of those moments. Jesus takes the opportunity to be compassionate. Jesus was showing the opportunity for kindness and putting his love, his words of love, into action. Let me give you a small definition of compassion. Compassion in the Bible, every time you see it, the term that's used, many other English terms for it, but the Greek term, splag nisomai. 
I know you're thinking, Shomai, you're smelling the food. Splank ni Shomai. Not Shomai. Splank ni Shomai. Literally, splank ni Shomai, which is compassion, means to have your bowels moved or turned. So your innards, when they're moving, literally, that was, that's what it means. But figuratively, and every time it's used, it means to feel sympathy, empathy. There's something in you that's moved when you see a need, you see a situation, you see someone hurting. There's something in you that sympathizes, that empathizes, oh. It's not just pity, because compassion moves. It drives you towards action. So a good definition for our compassion today would be to move, to be moved towards meeting a need, whatever need it is. It is compassion, it is love in action. Note this very special meeting that Jesus was in. Jesus was always with a large crowd. There's two large crowds meeting together just outside of the city. One crowd was rejoicing. They were with Jesus. They were being taught words of life. And the other crowd going out or mourning. And this happened many times in Scripture. When one crowd with Jesus and the other crowd sad and lonely and desperate. They meet together. Jesus always uses that opportunity to reach out in loving kindness. <clears throat> Jesus always bridges that gap. When you're going through your days of hardship and difficulty, don't forget Jesus is able to reach out and bridge that gap, bring joy, bring hope, bring comfort and love. <clears throat> One crowd, they're the representing, uh, each crowd representing an only son. One was destined, one was dead and destined to live. One was alive but destined to die, to put it poetically. The case of the only way, meeting the one on his way. One, was, one son was supposed to save the world, and one was supposed to save his widowed mom. Two crowds representing two mortal enemies. One of death and despair, the other of life and hope. Guess how that two will meet. That two will meet because Jesus was courageous in compassion. This would not have happened, this would not be recorded if not for Jesus' act of love and compassion. There's this guy, his name's Edwin Robinson. I'm sure you don't know him. He became blind and deaf after a certain truck accident. <clears throat> Nine years later, he was already blind, he was already deaf. While he was out on a stroll, outdoors, he was hit by lightning. When he regained consciousness, he was being treated for his burns. He was in the hospital. Something happened. He regained his sight and he regained his hearing because he was struck by lightning. After nine years of being deaf and being blind, some of us will say, Wow! Suerte! What a timely accident. What a fortunate coincidence. What a lucky set of circumstances. Boy, he's, what stroke of luck he has. <clears throat> now, ask yourself, do you really think that Edwin Robinson was lucky? Do you really think it was just an accident? You see, the way I see it, and the way how, how God has, has made me believe in his word, there are no such thing as Accidents, no coincidences, no accidental blessings, no lucky meetings. Only what I would say, divine anointed appointments. Divine appointments. Have you had one of those appointments? Maybe today is a divine appointment for you. Maybe this time God has appointed you. You're not here by accident. And somehow you're hearing this word, not by accident. Maybe this is your appointed time, an appointed appointment with God. Are you aware that every day these encounters happen in your life? Someone in your family, on your bus, or your train, your work, over lunch, in church. Whenever you're with people, you're interacting with them, the question is, 
Are you seeing that as an opportunity for compassion, for kindness, for love? Do you take that opportunity to shine and be a positive influence towards them? The other one is because of all the isolation and the fear, we're all just distancing ourselves. It's going to be an issue in the next few more weeks and months. Someone said this wisely. If you live in a graveyard too long, you stop crying when someone dies. We get to be numb. We get to be apathetic. I just don't care. Or you want to insulate yourself from hurt. You trust God to take care of your needs. Now you can love others. That's why it's courageous. Courageous compassion. It opens your eyes to the needs around you. A lot depends on what one sees. When you see a situation, do you think, you're, are they a victim? Are they a nuisance? Are they a pest? Are they a, an interruption to your schedule? Are they a danger to you? Is that simply a person in need? What do you see? What do you see when you see people? Do you see like what we talked about last week? Do you see categories and color and labels? Do you see status? Do you see their educational achievements? Do you, do you see or do, do you value that relationship? Do you see a person, simply a person in need? Do you look at how they dress, how they talk, where they live? Is it important to you how long uh, you, you ask, how long have you been in the U.S.? You know, some people ask that here. I don't know why, but you know, maybe just to get to know you. Where did you study? Where did you finish? What is your job? What do you drive? What brand do you wear? What can you do for me? How important are you? What team do you cheer for? What politician did you vote for? If those things matter to you, it's going to be a hindrance towards compassion. Some of us have our biases. Some of us have our, have our own way. But you need to be courageous. Step out of that and reach out with the love of God in action. It was a Samaritan, remember in the story? A Samaritan helped a Jew. Mm, I also remember the ten lepers. Only one came back. And the Bible was clear with it. The one who came back was a Samaritan. Jesus had clearly stated that in the, in the Gospel of, Ma, uh, of Luke also. See, compassion starts with what you see. Some of us go out, we close our eyes. We enjoy the presence of God. We go out and we close our eyes. Oh, I don't want to see evil. I don't want to see rudeness. I don't want to see bad people. I'm just going to close my eyes and enjoy the presence of God. You can do that. You can do that. But there will be no room for compassion. You might as well be dead. There's no room for Hurting with the hurting. There's no room for feeling with those that are down and out. What you see matters. If you see a homeless person, do you see social injustice? Immediately when you see homeless camps, what comes into your mind? That government. Oh, these people, where do my taxes go? When you see someone who's hurting, Someone who's hurting because of bad decisions they made. What comes in? What do you see? Do you see a, a person that is a victim of their own and they say, see? Sometimes with pride, sometimes with arrogance, sometimes with conceit. Careful. Careful what you see. Or do you see a soul that needs the love and the compassion the same way that Jesus did? Courageous compassion steps out opens their eyes to the needy. Number two, courageous compassion opens your heart towards ministry, towards true ministry. Ministry in its simplest form, in the simplest definition, is simply meeting a need. So it's not about preaching a sermon. It's not about, uh, that's all part of ministry. But in a, in a simpler form, in a day-to-day -day kind of form, ministry simply means to meet a need. If there is a need in your family, in someone's life, and you can help do that, and you do that, that's ministry. 
courageous compassion steps out, opens your heart towards being used by God to meet a need. When you meet anyone's emotional, financial, spiritual, physical, or mental need, you are doing ministry. Amen? There are many that are wounded, many that are hurting, many that are poor, many that are compassion-starved. What have you done? You felt it. You were moved by it. You thought about it. What have you done? What are you doing? And what do you plan to do? What are you doing wasting your time here in church? Did you just say that? You're the pastor. Yes. Don't waste your time just absorbing God's blessings and God's love. It's not just for you. When God blesses you, there's a part of that that is also supposed to bless others. Are you looking out so that your eyes are open to the needs? Are you looking out so that your heart begins to feel, to feel compassion towards others? Pity, empathy, sympathy, whatever it is that will get you to move towards meeting that need. That your prayers are filled with God. Make my day an opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. No, not, not, not just change the world today, but somehow make, make it better for my brother. Make it better for my sister. Open my heart so that I may respond to the need. Amen? Not with rituals, not with traditions, not with titles and positions. It is far easier... Oh, I like this statement that I wrote here. It is far easier to be religious than to be courageous with compassion. It's easier to say to the need, let me pray for that. But sometimes, I agree, sometimes that's all that you can do. But many times it's not. It's easier to just be religious than to be courageous with compassion. You all know the Good Samaritan law. You know how the Good Samaritan law came into being, right? There were people that simply didn't care. It was in the 60s in New York. Someone got attacked violently many times and for many hours. No one was doing anything. It was filled with people that, that were seeing it, that were hearing it, that were observing it. None of them reacted in a way that helped Kitty Genovese. And after that, because of the horror of that, a Good Samaritan law was... The Good Samaritan law is meant to protect someone who will step out in courage and help. You see someone who is in need, and you step out and help. A lot of people are, oh, I don't want to be sued. I don't want to be part of a lawsuit. I just want to help. So the Good Samaritan law was put up so that you can go ahead, act it out, and live out your faith, love someone, meet that need. See, she was stabbed several times. And that attacker came back five minutes later and attacked her again and again. Another few minutes, she was sexually assaulted many times. The whole attack took 32 minutes. After the first call, it took only two minutes. 38 people attacked Kitty. No one did anything for 32 minutes. They were just observing. There's nothing in them that moved towards action and even called the police. They called 32 minutes later. It's called Good Samaritan because of that Samaritan that helped the Jew. Remember? The one that put that, 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 that one who was robbed and that one who was left on the road to die. <clears throat> if anyone had an excuse, that would have been the Samaritan. He would say, he was a Jew. Let another Jew help him. Or maybe it's not safe for me. This is a not safe place. Maybe the robbers are still hiding there. Or maybe I might be implicated as a suspect. But all of, all of these hang-ups, I would say, stop us from opening our heart towards compassion. We've become cold. We've become rude. We've become disrespectful. We've become distant. And our excuse, well, you know, pandemic. Careful, careful that this pain and suffering is real, that we went through does not numb our hearts, that we don't anymore pray, God, open my heart so that I may be 
of use to others, of service to others. Courageous compassion opens your heart towards ministry. And the last, not the least, <clears throat> courageous compassion opens your hands in action. It's not enough to have a heart that feels. It's not enough to have a, a mind and, a, and, a, and, and eyes that, that see, but you need hands and feet that put action. It's not enough to have faith, James was saying. You have to have works that accompany that faith, that prove that faith, that show that you have that faith. In the same way, it's not enough to feel. It's not enough to like or comment on Facebook or, or social media. It's, enough, uh, it's not enough that you, you just, uh, oh, you need to do something about it. Pray that you get courage. Courage towards love that opens its hands in real action. You cannot help but act. There's something in you as a Christ follower that wants to help. That is changed enough that says, I can risk it. It's worth it. I want to help. Frederick Buchner says this, Compassion is the sometimes fatal capacity for feeling what it is like to live inside somebody else's skin. It is the knowledge that there can never really be any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy for you too. That's compassion. Compassion is when you are rejoicing and you're happy and something inside you says, I wish I can make others happier too. When you're feeling comfortable and blessed and full of God's favor, you're looking out towards someone that can, maybe I can bless someone. Maybe I can help someone. And you actually do. Compassion gets involved. I've told you about the sign in a mall. Nice to look at, nice to hold. If you break it, we consider it sold. And that's why people say, and you tell your kids, don't. You break it, you buy it. Don't touch it. We just don't like to touch anyone's life anymore. No one wants to get involved. That's their life. That's their business. That destroys community, right? Uh, you know, that's, that's his style. Let him be. I understand that. I understand personal space. I understand privacy. But, to a certain degree, you need to open your heart and your mind and be led by the Spirit to occasions where a compassion-starved community needs that personal touch and care and someone who will get out of their way and their comfort zone to show some true compassion. Amen? No one gets involved because they're expecting someone else to get involved. That someone else, he's a very famous person. Somebody. Who's going to do it? Somebody. This Mr. Somebody is just so great. Everyone expects him to do everything. <laughs> Hopefully we're not calloused or numb, but sensitive. Sensitive. Discerning. Simple acts. Ian Gorman was a fifth grader at Lake Elementary School. Oceanside, California. Lee Ian Gorman was undergoing chemotherapy. Wow, fifth grader lang, no? He was undergoing chemotherapy for lymphoma. All of his hair was starting to fall out. He had his head shaved because his hair was falling out. What did the classmates do? All 13 of his boy classmates shaved their heads too. So Ian wouldn't feel out of place. It was 10-year-old Kyle who started it all. He talked to some other boys, and before long, they all trekked to the barbershop because this is what they said. The last thing he would want, the last thing Ian would want is to not fit in. We just wanted to make him feel better, and this is the way they all shaved their heads. <laughs> For a fifth grader, that's courageous compassion. That's true love in action. That's what I'm saying. If I can make someone's day better, 
If I can make someone's situation a little better, and if I can do something even at personal risk and cost, let me be used for that. Compassion opens your hands in action. It costs. Sometimes it hurts. It's a risk. It's never out of just surplus. It does take that risk. It is courageous. It's not the popular thing to do. Today, it's like, let him be. Let's pray for them. No. Pray about how God can open your mind, your heart, and your hands towards really helping. Remember our, our, uh, our pattern. Jesus saw, Jesus moved, Jesus acted. Now what happened because of that simple act of love of Jesus? The man that was dead sat up. So this is not Lazarus. This is someone else. The man sat up and began to talk. Showed undeniable proof. I'm not just dreaming. He's really alive. Having come down from that coffin that they had in and gave him back to his mother. They were all, the Bible says, they were all filled with awe and wonder. They praised God. Miracles happen when you and I are used by God for simple, everyday compassion. I'll say that again. Miracles in the kingdom of God happen if you and I make ourselves available for compassion to go through. Courageous compassion. Amen? And also, for the gospel, what happened? The news about Jesus spread. In the same way that the news about Jesus spread because of Lazarus coming back from the dead, there was news about Jesus coming up. You know, you know the widow of Nain? Well, he's no longer alone. She's no longer alone because Jesus, you know, and the spru- that spread the news about Jesus, that Jesus was the resurrection and the life, that there was hope, that there's comfort, that there's healing. Compassion makes a difference. Compassion changes the world. Amen? Oh, some of you are thinking of, of lofty stuff, getting this, uh, getting billions and billions of dollars so that we will change the, the, uh, the world. No. Compassion, love, kindness, care. It's not a secret. It's something that you and I have free access to. Amen. An anonymous writer wrote this. For God so loved the world, not just a few, the wise and the great, the noble and the true, those of favored class or rank or hue, for God so loved the world, do you? Do you, my brothers and sisters, have courageous compassion? Have you ever noticed how Jesus seems to be drawn to the brokenhearted, the lepers, the prostitutes, those that are depressed, the sick, the sinful, shattered people? Jesus seems to be drawn towards them. Not surprising because the Bible says, Psalm 34, 18, the Lord is near to those who are of, have a broken heart and saves such that have a crushed spirit. Luke 4, 18, quoting from Isaiah, Jesus is saying, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Brothers and sisters, God is not just after those that look good, that, are, that have it all together. God loves them too. But God has a soft spot for hurting people. And guess who God has sent? To reach out and love them. To reach out and care for them. To reach out and meet that need. It's you. Point to the person to your left and your right. Tell them, it's you. It's you that God has called to love and love courageously. So if there is... Everything okay? Okay. It's the chair. It's the chair that's broken. Compassion. Thank you, Brother Brandon. Sorry. Are you okay? 
What was I saying? Jesus has a soft spot for hurting people. If you're hurting right now, Jesus loves you. If you're not, then Jesus is going to use you to reach out and meet the needs of those around you. St. Francis was quoted as saying, I'm not sure if he said it, but it's nice. Preach Jesus, he says. If necessary, use words. Compassion opens our eyes towards the need, opens our hearts towards ministry, and opens our hands in to 